Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So great to see each of you all in Sunday school today. Had some nice rain. Looks like that's moved out. Now we've got some sunshine, just the way I like it. So um, it's great to see you all again. And uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to ask the Lord to help us this morning. I need His help. Do you need His help today? Amen. <laughs> I need His help today, so we're going to ask for God's good grace today to be upon all of us. But if you have a special prayer request that you want to give into the classroom today, uh, and we will we will agree together with you and join in faith and pray. Let you let us know at this time, or maybe a praise report. Um, I'd like for everyone to still remember uh, Tina Franklin. I heard that her husband last night, and her blood pressure did come up enough for them to do, be able to do dialysis yesterday, but she's still not doing well. They just had to give her something to make her relax, and so she's sleeping a lot. She has an infection, but they can't find where it's coming from. So just remember her and her whole family. Also, Tony Lane is back in the hospital, and he's not doing really well, looking at, he's looking at long-term um, pulmonary we have. Alright, let's these two requests. Who else is in there? I'm going to do the test this week, but I would appreciate your praise. Okay, let's remember to do this week. I don't think that's praying to me when I have my shoulder surgery and I just ain't going, I've got two different words that work for me. I don't think it's wrong for that. You're so welcome. We'll continue to pray for you. Remember all the way. church at Mountain View Manor Friday morning and it was awesome. It was awesome. We had about 20. Uh, they could have one person per table. The dining room looked completely full because there was somebody at every table but it was awesome. All those beautiful crinkled up eyes you could tell they were smiling and just rejoicing that we got to have church again. It was wonderful. Remember Matthew. <laughs> Who else today? Um, do you remember Bobby Jenkins? I haven't heard about that. Oh, he's still really bad. Yeah, he was, he was really good bad. Okay, that's perfect. Let's take the continuing Bobby. Anybody else this morning? All right, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, we'll be able to do this and prepare this morning. Thank you, Jesus. So it's very needful that we look at these things 
uh, closely. So um, grace and truth are fundamental or essential parts. They are foundational tenets of the Christian faith. Without grace, without grace, there is no hope for mankind. I hope that you and I believe that at this point. There is no other hope for mankind without grace. We are lost in our sins and we are desperate for a Savior. For it is by grace and grace alone that we are saved. And it is by truth that we are set free. Because when we realized that we were hopelessly lost and we heard the truth of the Gospel and then we received it, then we were made truly free. Do you believe that today? Amen. We were set free when we received that message. That's why the gospel is the good news today. As it, and it's why it's so important that it continues to be broadcast because it is the good news. And when we hear that and we realize who we are, how desperate we are in, in need of a Savior, we receive that grace, that truth, then we are set free today. And I hope you feel that in your, in your heart and in your soul because freedom is a beautiful gift today from God. And, um, and that's by Him. So John chapter 1, verses 14 and verse number 17 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and and truth. So Christ came. John's recording this. We saw him. We beheld his glory. He was in our presence. We we touched him. We saw him. We saw the things he was doing. We know that he was the only begotten of the Father. And how did he come? He came full of grace and truth. And if he's full of grace and truth, there's no room for anything else, folks. He's full of grace and truth. We can depend on that today. And verse number 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You see, this scripture points out the stark contrast between what we can get from man and what we can get from God. And I'm so thankful today that grace and truth comes from God Almighty. I don't have to look to a man for grace and for truth. We would be hard pressed today to look to a man to receive grace and truth. Amen. That came from our Heavenly Father. That comes from God alone and from God above. So I'm so thankful for that. So grace and truth comes from God. Oh, we can get points all right for trying hard to find what we need from any other source but from God. We try so hard. But you see, He is the only one in whom all fullness dwells, as Colossians chapter 1 tells us. You see, He is the one that our souls cry out to. And why is that? Because the soul is what belongs to Him. It's what came from Him. So we cry out to Him from that place. And you see, we might try hard to find grace and truth or justification in this world or in this life from any other source it seems sometimes other than God Himself. We might look to works to do that. We might, my goodness, we've tried really, really hard probably to justify ourselves through works. Maybe through our position. Maybe through the things that we attain in this life. Maybe, you know, intellectually or maybe the knowledge that we've been able to attain. Maybe we try to find grace and truth from other places. But it is Christ who came to this world full of grace and truth. So we are to look to Him to receive grace and truth today. Because when it comes from Him, it's going to be exactly as it should be. And it's going to be how you and I need to know it and you and I need to receive it. You see, we will go into truth and we'll talk about a lot of different things that people today are calling truth, but it's not true. It's their truth. It's called a relative truth. It's the truth that they say they believe. But you see, truth, just as it has to have a foundation. 
It has to be absolute. There cannot be a truth for you and a truth for me. If that happens, the world descends into chaos. That is not possible. So God is the foundation. God is the bearer. He is full of grace and truth today. So we are going to start this morning on the topic of grace. So somebody give me a good working definition of grace. What what is grace? What's your definition of grace? Our sins are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He gives us that same grace we can put the past in us. It's in the soul that comes into our life, Lord. Yeah. If He forgives us, what is the part that we forgive just like He does? So the Spirit that lives in us is yeah. the same Spirit that He has. Yeah. We just, we just grace this. Thank you, Brother Mike. You just taught my whole lesson. <laughs> you did good. You did really, really good. So, and then yes. also, great supposed to give you strength to carry on. Sure. You know, because I know sometimes we're going to fall through, we're going to fail, we're going to you know, mess up. But God's great. He's got to help us to strengthen us. So, he, when Paul was afraid to uh, thrive, he's afraid to take the thorn out of his legs. And that's what God said, my great suspicion. Makes you stronger. It makes you to overcome a lot of different things, but that grace is there to help us. Yes, yes. And we and so, Brother Scotty, we absolutely have to understand what grace is, right? For us to be able to lean in and to lean on grace, and what God really wants us to understand that grace is all about. So, I think for you know, for years, I think probably the most popular definition for grace has been this idea of unmerited favor, right? So, so grace is the freely given, right? Just as Brother Mike said, unmerited favor and love of God. Thank God for that. So when we talk about something that's unmerited, we're talking about something that's simply not deserved, right? It's, we, we did not do anything to deserve it. And I think that's, that's our quandary. I think that's the place where we have the hardest time with this idea of grace. We get tripped up on it because in our world, we don't get anything unless we first give something, right? That's how the world works with us. So it's very hard to grasp this idea that we can have received something completely undeserving on our part. That is unmerited favor. That is unmerited grace. So a merit is something deserving or it's a reward for something you've done. So that's not how grace works. And a favor is a gift bestowed as a token of goodwill or of a kind act. It's something done or granted out of goodwill rather than from justice or from, or from remuneration. In other words, if I go to work and I work eight hours a day, my employer is going to remunerate me, he's going to pay me or she's going to pay me for my time there because I've given something and they're going to give me something back. But we have got to get away from this thought that we can work for grace. And I think we try really, really hard to do that. I even think so much of that is just completely unconscious on our part. We may say, yeah, we get it. Nothing we can deserve. But boy, I think we try really hard to earn the favor and love of God. Whenever, if we would just relax, as Pastor Marty says, chillax, and just try to understand and grasp what grace truly is. I think we would enjoy this life in Christ so much more. So, any, so some more comments. What, what does grace, so we've got a working definition of grace, but what does grace mean to you personally? What does it mean to you personally this morning? If, if God just loves you. That we want to have God's love. But 
But to me, His grace and His mercy is more important than love to me. Because if He just loved us, for God so loved the world, but that verse didn't end there, did it? For God so loved the world. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. That He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. His love is wonderful. Yeah. But He didn't stop it. Right. He gives us stuff. He gives us the grace and the mercy. And without that, we have nothing. We have nothing. Because when we foul up, we have grace and mercy most of the time for our children. Don't we? The Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. But we don't never normally give our neighbor the grace and the mercy. Yeah. We love them. A lot of times we have to. But we don't give our neighbor the grace and the mercy. Yeah. But we do give our children grace and mercy. A lot of times, right? A lot of times we will. That's but I, I mean, we, you, you understand what I'm saying. So because God loves We're his children. And he loves us a whole lot more than we love our children. I can't hardly grasp that, but, but he does. He gives us grace and mercy. That's what it means to me. How thankful I am. I'm thankful for his love, but I'm more thankful for his grace. Grace is the reason any of us have faith. You know, uh, without His grace, not one of us would be sitting here today. You know, it's by His grace that we're here. You know, He sent His Spirit to draw us. Without that drawing, nobody's going to the Father. So none of us had faith without Christ first drawing us. And that's how great His grace is. None of us would be here without Him. I believe it's kind of like the old song Amazing Grace. It changed the rich life for me. You know, it does. I mean, look at the grace. And and we look at our life and where we were and where we are today. And it's just amazing. It is. He's just blessed us and touched us and kept us and guided us. And it'll make us stronger no matter what we do if we just keep on with that grace. A lot of times we have to give grace to people. I mean, you know, there's like, say, neighbors. We're talking about neighbors. Mike was. You've got my neighbors that might do things to us that do things. Yeah. But when you show kindness and love and grace, yeah. you can just kind of smooth things out. Yeah. There wasn't another way. Right. Good. So I'm glad we kind of all on the same wavelength here. Go ahead. I think about it as if things are going really bad or even immediate bad, I think about um, my relationship with God as I'm in favor. Because um, I think if you think about it that way, that's the favor, you know, um, that's the grace that he gives me. And just like, you know, we don't have favors with our children, but we do. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I tend to, that gives me peace. True. I'm God's favor. It's awesome. It's a beautiful thought about grace. Well, the church quite a long time ago, and then I got out of the will of God, and I disobeyed more than I did. To me all, I can look back now and see God's grace and His hand over me yeah. and protect me yeah. and want me to come back and heal. Yeah. So there was many times, you know, uh, Satan could have touched my life, and that would have been the end. But God's grace saw me through because He could see the future. He saw me bow down over there on the floor. You know, give my heart back to him. Me and Marty pray it, you know, come to church and that's the good Marty is here and I brother that's time to pray. You know, I want to feel God's power one more time. Yeah. You know. And he did. And he, he saved me and he 
But see, that's what drew you, Brother Scotty. That's what drew you in him. You see, I just think if we have, when we mess up, if we have this distorted view of how disappointed he is in us and how angry he is with us, it's not, that doesn't draw us back to him. But this love and this grace, this unmerited favor that continues to draw us and pull us. And listen, we can run. We can run as far as we possibly can, but you will not outrun the love and the grace of God. And I'm just telling you that that's very freeing for me today. That makes me a very happy woman today, a very happy child of God to know. Because sometimes instead of doing the very thing we should do when we messed up, and that is to fall on the grace of God, to just bring it to Him, to bring whatever it is we think, oh, it's too ugly, or it's too wrong, or it's too this, or it's too that. I can't bring this to God when that's the very thing we need to do. What do we do? We pick it up and we run in the opposite direction, which is the worst thing that we can do. Grace says, I can take it. Grace says, bring it to me. I can take it. I can take whatever it is. But until we truly understand that, how are we ever going to feel welcomed and drawn back into the presence of God? We need to understand what grace is today. We need to understand what it's all about today. And I'm so thankful for that. Brother Bill, you have a comment, I think? The Word says that we are saved by grace. Yes. But to me, that grace or that favor is what keeps me saved too. Sure. And actually, and maybe this is just a genetic thing, but I think it's the thing that continues to save me <laughs> every single day. It's the very thing that continues to save me. And I'm so grateful for that. Yes, there was a point in time when I finally surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and I got down at an altar and I asked Him to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life. And that was the beginning of this journey of faith. But He saves me every day. I, I just so totally and so strongly believe that. It wasn't just a one-time gift. Thank God for that, Sister Linda. It's just not a one and done. It's not a one-time and it'll do you. It is as much as we need for as long as we're here. And I'm so thankful for that that it is a daily, a daily occurrence in my life. There's been so much debate about grace, I think. You hear it preached from different men or women or taught from different men or women. And, you know, they, they differ on what their idea of grace is. And once again, we, mankind, have taken something that is supposed to be simple and we have complicated it. I truly do believe that. We have made it difficult and we're not supposed to do that. That's not our place to do. Folks, we did, we're not the ones full of grace and truth. It is God alone. It is Jesus Christ. So I don't think we should be making uh, grace difficult. You know, it's the same thing we do with salvation. We make it so difficult. And it's as simple as a child can understand it. Grace is also something that we are not to make difficult today. You see, some say that we've watered down the power of grace, while others say we're guilty of peddling a hyper grace. But for me, I believe strongly <clears throat> that grace is more about the person, and that person is Jesus Christ, than it is about any concept or act or tenet of our faith. Grace is not about you or me, it is not about one single solitary thing that we can do. It is about who Christ is and why He came and what He came to do. He came to save His family. 
You are his family today. I am his family today. And he came himself. Do you understand? He didn't fall to somebody else to come to save you and I, to bring us grace into this world. He came himself. You're that important today. And until we can realize our value, I don't think we're ever going to realize completely what grace is all about. How possibly could we do that if we think so lowly of ourselves? How could we ever think that we could be deserving of anything that a holy God has for us? But He came Himself. This is why He came. He came to save His family. And where rewards like hope of salvation and heaven and eternal life were so far out of our reach, or any hope of attaining them by anything meritorious that we could ever do. You see, Christ stepped in and said, salvation will not have anything to do with what we do or don't deserve. Hallelujah. It will be about God's love, God's unmerited favor, and God's heart for His children. You see, mamas, Whenever the doctor laid that sweet little precious baby in your arms after you gave birth to that child, did you need any, any, did that baby have to do one single thing to earn your love, to earn your favor? Anything. Did that, or was it just automatic? Was it freely given, unmerited favor and love? Was it? Yes, it was. So then let's multiply that by, well, God. <laughs> and that is grace today. And I'm so grateful for that. You see, the Bible says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's His entire purpose that He came into this world for. It was to seek and to save you and I that were lost, that are lost. We need to understand that. And it is by His grace that we are saved. It is by His grace because He's full of grace today. He was able to offer salvation through grace. So, is grace a big deal? You better believe it. It's a huge deal. Without it, you and I are dead in the water. There is no hope for us without it. You see, if salvation were granted on merit, not one person could possibly earn it. Right. Not one single person Amen. could possibly earn it. Not any of us on this earth are good enough. Mark chapter 10 says, and this was Jesus that said this, there is none good but one, and that is God. You see, salvation has come to you and me by the beautiful, precious, priceless, powerful gift of grace. And that gift was personified in Jesus Christ Himself. And I think there's an important distinction for us to look at this morning as well. So I'm going to ask you this question. Is grace and forgiveness the same thing? It is not the same thing. Grace and forgiveness are not the same thing. You see, forgiveness is like so many other things. It is a gift inside the gift of grace. You see, if I drew a parallel in our lives to grace, it would be to a bank. You see, this bank would be called the first universal bank of grace. You make a deposit of faith and you get a withdrawal of forgiveness. Thank God. There are no non-sufficient funds charges at this bank because the accounts are always full. There is no need to worry about coming back for as much as you need because the president of the bank is God who built the bank on the foundation of His Son, Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. Christ is the epitome of grace. And there is no boundaries and there is no limit to the grace of God. He is full of grace and truth today. You see, there are many gifts inside the gift of grace, but forgiveness is the biggie. 
We just got through with a close look at prayer. Christ himself left us the blueprint of prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Included in this prayer, he said, to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The as in this line does not mean at the same time. It means in the same way. In other words, it's not saying forgive us our debts at the same time as we forgive our debtors. It is saying forgive us our debts in the same way that we are forgiving our debtors. Whoa. Ouch. Buddy. That's a big deal, folks. We need to understand that. You see, this point was so important, in fact, that it is the only part of the whole prayer that Christ reiterates or expounds upon again after the prayer had ended. Matthew chapter 6, 14 and 15 says, and this was right after He gave that prayer, He said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We must forgive our debts. If God is going to forgive our debts in the same way that we are willing to forgive those who have committed debts or trespasses against us today. It's important for us to understand that. Because, boy, it is so good to feel that grace of God feel that forgiveness of God. But are, is it going any further than ourselves? Exactly what Brother Mike was talking about this morning. You see, I heard it said that if we are harboring unforgiveness towards someone, that we have forgotten what we ourselves were forgiven of. Have we done that? Do we remember what God has forgiven us for? So Christ gave us a warning in the compelling words of Matthew chapter 18, and I'm going to read that to you this morning. And it starts at verse number 21. If you want to turn there with me, that's fine, or I'll just read it to you. But it is Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse number 21. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him, which owed him ten thousand talents. Now I looked that up this week. It says that's, that's roughly equivalent to nineteen billion dollars in today's funds. Okay? But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the Lord of that servant, he was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, which again, what I read, said it was roughly $17,000 in our today, in today's monies. And he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that if you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. But he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, you wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you desired me to do that, should not you also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, 
if you from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Do we, do we understand what we've been forgiven of? Do we understand how great our debt was? It was a debt that there was no way that we would ever be able to repay. No way. And we were like this man who fell before the king and begged forgiveness. And he out of mercy and compassion and grace, unmerited favor, forgave us of our debt. But we in turn, he, what is he saying here? If you have been, if you truly realize how much you have been forgiven of, then it shouldn't be hard for you at all to forgive others who have committed a wrong against you. And it's not just that. The caution in all of this is if we don't, if we don't forgive those that have committed wrongs against us, what's going to happen? We're not going to be forgiven. That debt that we owe is going to be reinstated, isn't it, Brother Mike? And there is no hope of repayment, folks. There is no hope that we have of finding forgiveness any other way. So you and I have to understand this is God's this is God's justice. This is His grace. This is how it works. That if we have earned it freely, not earned, if we have received it freely, if we have been freely giving, given it to then we are to in turn freely give it as well. You see, this is why forgiveness is so important, but also why it is so powerful. We are most like our Heavenly Father when we are freely giving the gift of forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32 says to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. How how better could we put it? How how more succinctly or powerfully could we put it? You see, forgiveness is like love in that it is a choice. It is an act of obedience. It is not a feeling, <laughs> and we don't do it out of the goodness of our hearts, but rather we do it because we too have been forgiven. And until we get that part, until we really do realize in some form or fashion how much we've been forgiven of, we will always fail at giving forgiveness to other people because I think it's only in the light of what we've been forgiven of that we realize there's absolutely nothing that we are justified in holding against any other person. That's what forgiveness looks like. So it is a choice. More importantly to me, it is an act of obedience because God told us to do it, right? And sometimes it's hard. We talk about love being a choice. We talk about forgiveness being a choice. Those are hard things. I know that's a difficult thing, folks, but sometimes... We just do it based on obedience simply because God, our Father, told us to do it. And then maybe at some point our feelings will catch up with our obedience, right? Maybe. But the most important thing is to remember that we do it as an act of obedience to the Lord. So is forgiveness difficult? It certainly can be. Anybody who's been hurt, anybody that's wrong, you know that feeling. You know how how intensely personal and hurtful that it can be when somebody has wronged you. But I do believe that forgiveness can be and should be and probably always is a process for us particularly because forgiveness can be hindered by the fact that we can't forget, right? We can't forget the act or the wrong. But you see, that is where the you and I have to have a mindful choice. We have to make a mindful choice. We have to be deliberate and purposeful about choosing 
not to dwell on it, right? How, how many things in our lives have we made like a thousand times worse simply because we just sit and mull it to death, right? We just sit and roll it over and over and over again in our minds and we won't let it go. How much, how much trouble have we brought to our own self simply because of that? Because we get something up here in this noggin and we refuse to let it go. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 absolutely gives us um, the key to how we are to combat that. And this is what it says in verse 3 through 5. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds. I'm going to tell you right now, the mightiest stronghold that you and I face, battle, deal with on a daily basis is <coughs> right up here. It's right up there in your head. And then it goes on to say, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And this is the important part. And this is the key, folks. This is the key. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That is the key. That's our ticket out of the place that we find ourselves in these strongholds of our mind. Whenever we need, we have to choose, folks, to take those wrong thoughts captive. Oh, yes, it's possible, and yes, we can do it. Yes, does it take effort? You better believe it does. It takes intentionality, but we can do it. And if we'll take captive any thought that, that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, and that can be anything. That's not just kings and principalities and powers. Folks, that's any thought that you get in your head that is against what the Word of God teaches, what the Spirit of God has put in you and I, any of those things. And so we cannot dwell on something, certainly not anything that's negative. We have to let those things go. When my children were little and they would have nightmares at night, they would come crying to Mama, and, I, and they would say, Mom, I would say, no, you've got to go back to sleep. Everything is fine. Everything's okay. It was just a bad dream. But they would say, Mama, I can't go back to sleep because I can't stop thinking about it. And I would simply say, you have to replace that thought with something good, with another thought that is something good. Is it that simple? Yep, it is. It is absolutely that simple. So we take those negative, bad, wrong thoughts into captivity and we submit them to the obedience of Christ. We are obedient to the Lord God Almighty, first and foremost. He's going to take care of the rest. You see, we get so good at justifying our unforgiveness that we probably don't even call it that. That's just probably just too hard for us. We, you know, we we like to deflect and 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 say, oh no, I I, I don't have any unforgiveness. But we know we do sometimes. You might say, Janine, you don't know what this person has done to me. Well, you're right. I don't. But I do know what we did to Jesus, and we killed him. <laughs> and he still forgave us. You say, Amen. well, I think, yes, you did kill him. For God so loved the world, he gave yes. us only God's Son. Just as, sure, just as sure as the people that stood there that day in the very presence of Christ, when they hung him, up on that tree, on that cross, he, you and I are guilty of putting him there as well. There's no need for us. It is so absurd to me when I hear people talking about it was the Jews that killed Jesus. It was the Romans that killed Jesus. We killed Jesus. Do we get that? He died for us. He went there for you and for me. And if He forgave us, of what we did to a holy God, then we should be able to forgive others as well. You see, feeling that what someone has done to you is 
far worse than anything you have done to any where to anybody else you see when we start comparing offenses like that we are on a slippery slope i'm just going to tell you right now because we stay trapped by justifying our hurt and our unforgiveness when we compare how good we think we are <laughs> to how the person who has who has committed this wrong act to us or this hurt to us, but you see the comparison should always be to God's goodness. Don't compare the bad that someone else has done to your own good. And if you're thinking you're that good, you're thinking wrong. There is none good but one. That's Him. That's God Almighty. So our comparison should always be to the goodness of God. Then there will simply be no room to justify and forgiveness toward anyone. So I, I asked you, and I, I encourage you to set yourself free and trust that God is better at recompense than you and I will ever be. The Bible says, God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You see, we talked about last Sunday where the Bible says that He will in no wise afflict the wicked. He, he, keeps, he keeps the ledger, folks, not you and I. And in His good grace, and in His his power and his wisdom, he will recompense. And he can do that far better than you and I ever could. As a matter of fact, when we lash out in vengeance, we demand justice on our own and for our own personal reasons, all we ever do is make it worse. All we ever do is make it worse. So we've got to trust God to be able to do that and to do it the way that you should, that it should be done. Anybody can love someone who's being good to them. <laughs> but how about those enemies, right? Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now that's a tall order, right? That's a really tall order. We won't cast stones today. We won't say, oh, I've just got that all figured out and I just do that all so perfectly because I do not. God knows that. But I do know that if I continue, if I continue to immerse myself in His Word, if I continue to find myself in His presence, if I continue to ask the Holy Spirit of God to, to indwell me, to fill me, to help me, to lead me, to guide me, He's going to help me do that better and better, folks. All of us. That's how it works. This is a work in progress. So he gives us this tall order about loving our enemies. But you see, the greatest thing about that is that he has never expected more out of us than he was willing to give of himself. We'll never be able to say that. Oh, you're God. You can say, you know. No. He has never required anything more of us than He gave of Himself. You see, from the cross, He prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He wasn't about to carry any of that with Him as He was leaving this world. He left it all behind Him at the cross. And we are asked this morning to do the same. You see, from the wellspring of grace, Forgiveness has come to you and to me, and we are all to pay it forward. That was Brother Mike's point earlier this morning. You see, grace is personal because Christ is personal. And I'm telling you that until you know Christ personally, you simply will never be able to grasp the true power of grace. So lean in today. Pull up close to grace this morning. Grace does not turn away. You've never been good enough to deserve it, but you've never been bad enough to send it packing. I can tell you that for a fact today. Grace is Jesus, and He stared death, hell, and the grave in the face, and He conquered them all. Do you really think that your issues your faults, your failures, your weaknesses, or your sins stand a chance in the face of grace. It does not. And I'm so thankful for that. The Bible says where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. 
We can rest in that today. We can draw strength and help and hope in that today. Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, not anything that you and I could do to earn it, nothing. But and he, and he does that intentionally to keep men from boasting, right? Because we would surely do that. We would surely smote ourselves on our chest and say, "Good job! Look what I did! I saved myself, right? I'm so good. I was able to save myself." We can't do that. None of us can save ourselves. That is Christ and Christ alone. And that is by His grace that He delivers to all of us. I'll leave you with these last scriptures. And it's in Jeremiah chapter 9. Get over there right quick. And this is verse number 23 and 24. That last part of Ephesians chapter 2 says it's not the works, it's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. If we're going to boast today, you and I should boast about Jesus Christ. Okay? We should boast about what He's done for all of us. Jeremiah 9.23 says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So folks, it's not in your wisdom. It's not in how much you know. It's not in your bank account. It's not in your riches. It's not in how much power you've received or acclaim you've received in this world. It is about God. It is about Christ and Christ alone. And the fact that because He delights in exercising loving kindness and judgment, which is justice and righteousness in the earth, you and I are receiving the beautiful gift of grace today. I hope you've received it. He stands ready. To, to give it to you today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I encourage you to receive His gift of grace today. To get in His Word and ask Him to open your heart and to open your eyes to really, truly what grace is all about. And I'm going to tell you right now, when we get that part, you'll not look anywhere else. I'll tell you that much right now. Because there's nobody else that can do you like the good Lord can do you. There's nobody else that can fill you up like He can fill you up. And that is because of His grace today. And I'm so grateful for that. So we're out of time this morning. And I hope something's been said that helped you today. And I pray that God will give you a blessed upcoming week. Thank you for being here.